Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be joined by some of the greatest uh, minds and, and people actually building things here in, in the DeFi world. And I think we're all very lucky to hear their opinion on a number of interesting topics because they're the people that are actually getting, getting their hands dirty and getting all of these things built and driving, driving the world forward. So I think we have a few interesting topics to discuss and we'll kind of just jump right into it. Um, but just so everybody has context who's watching this, it might be useful for each of the, the, the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and what they do. And I guess we can start with, um, with Kane and he can just describe what he does briefly and then we can go to the others and then jump into the questions. Uh, yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sergey. So um, I'm the founder of Synthetics. Uh, Synthetics is a synthetic asset issuance platform on Ethereum. So uh, we allow people to get price exposure to a range of different assets um, via Chainlink oracles, obviously. Um, so, you know, we have assets like gold and silver, Bitcoin, uh, that you otherwise couldn't trade on Ethereum. Antonio, go ahead. Hey guys, I'm Antonio, the founder of DYDX. DYDX is one of the leading decentralized exchanges for margin and perpetual products. Perpetual products are just one of the most popular types of derivatives in cryptocurrency. Sergey. Well, hi everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sergey. Um, I'm a co-founder and uh, CEO of One Inch Exchange. We are Dex. Uh, leading aggregator uh, on the market on Ethereum. Uh, we uh, built uh, also several other uh, products like uh, first uh, MA with um, MMM, um, uh, with um, front running protection, for example, and uh, we are going to deliver some more products. Great, great. Great, thanks for, thanks for all being here and chatting through these interesting questions. I, I think DeFi is really accelerating at an amazing pace. And I, I think it'd also be interesting to hear, you know, how do you think that DeFi has developed over the last year? And during that development, is there anything that's, that's been particularly surprising to you? And if it, if it works for you, Antonio, I guess we can start, start with how you feel about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's obviously been quite a lot of stuff that's happened in the past year in DeFi. I think a lot of it surprised me, at least, um, where to start. I guess really just with the resurgence of kind of tokens in general. And obviously, it was really just the comp token and kind of their new liquidity mining scheme, which I think really kicked this off in a big way. Of course, there's been a lot of fast followers to that, Uniswap being one of the biggest, most notable examples. And I think just this really big explosion of new tokens that are all really interesting, doing interesting things, um, has made there be just a lot more different assets that people want to trade on Ethereum. And this is really what's been driving the, the big uh, increase in adoption of DeFi in general, because for the first time, like DeFi is the first place where you can trade a lot of these assets. Of course, Uniswap's a really great leader here. Um, just with all the volume they've been doing, the new tokens they're able to support. So I think I'd say the biggest highlight for me has just been the resurgence of tokens, a bunch of new assets that people want to trade, and that's just leading to a bunch of new volume for decentralized exchanges and other products. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Sergey, how how have you seen things develop over the last year, and you know what's been the most? Is, has there been anything that surprised you over that time? So I was surprised this year about uh, this huge growing of um, provided liquidity and lock liquidity and the several protocols. So Uniswap did a really great job with um, uh, getting more and more liquidity there right now around 2 billion and liquidity compared to last year, it's a huge jump, also based on the user uh, amount like between 20,000 users and 30,000 users are using everyday Uniswap. So, and um, and this is this is actually really great for 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 DeFi space. Um, we had this year a hype uh, of uh, several products. Uh, this Yam token, for example, and uh, Sushi uh, with uh, access cam of the uh, of the DEF, uh, which paid back the money. But at the end, it's it can can also such such projects can also or moves can damage the DeFi space. But anyway, we are still there, and we uh, um, we had really uh, great uh, growth, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to get more. So so Kane, you know how how is how is 
the DeFi space developed over the last year in, in, in what you've been seeing, you know, is there anything there that's particularly surprising to you? I think, you know, the, the resurgence of tokens um, was not necessarily surprising to me. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of validating, right? Like I've been one of the biggest advocates for, you know, tokens for a long time now. And, and the fact that they are a really powerful coordination mechanism. What really surprised me, I think, was uh, the comp, you know, specific aspect of the comp launch, was, which was this kind of blank slate token approach, right? Of like, we're gonna launch this thing that has, you know, very minimal rules built in, right? I I'd kind of had this intuition that like, you needed to have very clear rules about how the coordination would happen. But this idea that you could just, you know, release a token that only did governance and then let the governance actually solve those problems was was very surprising to me. I didn't see that coming. And I think that that, you know, was maybe one of the, the kind of critical uh, uh, innovations that allowed a lot of the you know next wave of tokens to, to, to kind of launch quickly without needing to know everything that they were going to do, right? They could just kind of launch a token, let the community uh, decide how they were going to change the rules and, and govern the system, um, which I think is, is you know, really, uh, really interesting and, and definitely caught me by surprise. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think there's definitely a lot of innovation. For, for me, like the fascinating thing was how far and how quickly and how far yield farming went. And I think that you actually, Kane, had a lot of initial insight into how that worked and made a lot of the first versions of how that were, were to work properly. And then it kind of really, really, really took off from, from other people kind of building on those ideas, which I found, found to be very impressive. But I, I think what it's actually done is it's given like an interest rate and it's given an interest rate that even gets people to take their Bitcoin and bring it into the DeFi ecosystem. And, you know, it even, I think, gives a reason for people in the traditional world to turn their assets into the crypto format because they could get an interest rate, whereas they couldn't get an interest rate from a bank account from their local bank. Right. So I think it's really I think the yield farming thing is misunderstood as something that's weird, but actually it's making a, a, a very fundamental use case in the form of yield. And for me, the fact that our, our ecosystem now in like less than a year successfully makes yield in volume is, is, is a pretty big innovation in, in, in my opinion. Hmm. Now, I mean, now, now that we have some of this progress and some of these things getting built, um, built the right way and getting to do more things than just kind of generate tokens and move them around, but actually create financial products that do things like generate yield, um, I'm actually wondering you know, how do you see some of this stuff scaling, right? How, how do you folks see DeFi as an ecosystem scaling and, and what role would layer twos have to play in that? And I, I guess the, you know, the first person we can ask uh, for this is um, Sergey. you know, what, what, what do you think about this point? So um, I think that we need Ethereum 2.0 to scale and not uh, layer two solutions. Mm -hmm. um, just because of the composability of layer two, which is difficult, yeah. And, uh, and uh, for example, for us, for the DEX aggregator, it's, uh, it's painful or it's not possible to integrate anyone who, uh, who is uh, not in, on layer one, yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we need better usability, user-friendly interfaces and, and processes. And with uh, adding additional complexity on top of, of existing products, it could be maybe uh, not profitable uh, and useful from our point of view. Um, we uh, also try to experiment with layer two with CK rollup, for example, also our friends. Um, Again, some Russian guys, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we will see what, what will happen. But uh, we are looking in direction of Ethereum two at all. Yeah, makes sense. I can see how that's complicated for more of a trading kind of focused focused environment. If the tokens tokens aren't on the layer two, do I think that's part of what a lot of them seek to solve? Right, is they seek to make that transition very seamless. Um, so yeah, I guess on this on this point of you know how you think DeFi will scale properly and how that how layer twos play into that, how how do you view that, Kane? How do you see that evolving? Yeah, I, I think you know we've all been waiting for uh, for Serenity for 2.0 for a long time now. Um, you know, uh, 
it's been around the corner for a while. And I think that we, um, you know, we were all kind of caught out a little bit uh, in the last, you know, three to six months, right, with the, the gas prices on Ethereum. And so, you know, one of the nice things about that is that it's really forced everyone to get their shit together and, you know, push hard to kind of, you know, accelerate scaling. Um, you know, so, uh, so I think we're now in a position where there's, you know, probably 20 different, very strong teams that are all working on these problems from different angles, right? Which is amazing. We finally got the level of investment that we needed, uh, you know, on, on layer two scaling, um, and, and amount of focus that we needed. So I think that, you know, there's going to be an interim period where, um, you know, if you, if you have a look at Vitalik's post, uh, from a couple of weeks ago about, you know, this roll up, uh, centric E2.0, roadmap, you know, I think we're going to have a, a transition period for, you know, maybe 18 months, 24 months where we're still stuck with ETH L1, right? Like, you know, ETH, uh, ETH1 is, is what we've got. Um, and so, you know, we need to try and uh, scale that as much as we can. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's issues with composability, but, you know, there's a few different things that I think we can do to, to kind of alleviate those issues. And, and I also think, you know, um, like, your, your point, Sergey, around, you know, composability, it's also a, a market opportunity, right? Realistically, particularly for a DEX aggregator, right? Like, you know, the more complex it is for a user to kind of interact with uh, all of these different L2s, the more opportunity there is, right? It's the same kind of uh, style of problem as like, trying to aggregate liquidity across all these DEXs, right? It's a total shit show. You guys came in and just put this layer across it, and all of a sudden it's easy. You just go to one place and you hit a button and it just does it for you, right? I don't know how the routing works or the pathfinder or anything like that, but you know, it just works for me, right? Um, I think like the same thing is- magic. Yeah, it's magic, <laughs> right? Like, and you know, it, it genuinely does abstract away the complexity, right? Like you just turn up and it's just this magical experience where you get the best fill, even if you don't know what the fuck's going on, right? And, and I think that that is uh, probably going to be a market opportunity in the next, you know, uh, again, couple of years where you've got all these different layer twos and you, someone needs to find a way to kind of unify them. So, you know, it, every, every, uh, kind of challenge, I think creates an opportunity as well. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's very well said. I think that's the right way to view it. Right. That's, that's what pe that's what we're all here to do is to solve these problems. And that's really, you know, what we're, what we're all doing in this space. So and Antonio, how, how do you feel about, you know, how DeFi is going to scale properly and, and how layer twos play into that. Yeah, first of all, I think it's obviously a really important problem. Uh, just the reach of DeFi is going to be super limited if people have to pay, you know, five to 10 plus dollars for every single trade that they're going to make. Uh, it's like we're barely even better, if at all, than like centralized finance or like your, you know, broker or whatever in mainstream finance. So we have to solve this problem, first of all. I think there are also just a lot of other really limiting things that people don't realize so much about uh, what's possible on layer one Ethereum right now. It's not just gas prices. It's basically like you can only write smart contracts that are very simple and like do like pretty simple things. Whereas on a layer two, if it has a lot more scalability, you can do a lot more interesting things to solve a lot of like interesting user experience problems, things like that. Um, and that's something we're really focused on at UIDX. I guess our plans, and we're working pretty hard on this, we're moving to layer two right now, basically. We're working on this. We're integrating with Starkware, which is a zero knowledge based rollup system that we're pretty excited about. There are a lot of other great scalability solutions that are out there. A lot of people are excited about Optimism, potentially other layer one chains. What I would say on layer one Ethereum is maybe I have an extreme view on this, but I would be extremely surprised if there are any benefits to smart contracts from layer two, or sorry, uh, Ethereum V2 or whatever um, in the next like three years. I think it's gonna take at least like three to five years for there to be any benefits. Just there's like, basically they're like currently implementing phase zero of like seven or eight phases or whatever. And that's been like for the past year or two. So I think it's just going to take quite a long time. And I think there are also some important, at least as far as I can tell, unsolved problems in uh, Ethereum scalability that they're still working towards. So in the interim, kind of like Kane said, I think we're going to be in this world where different people move to different layer two solutions. Obviously, like I said, DYDX moving to Starkware, um, you know, synthetics moving to Optimism, things like that. One of the other things I'll say is just, I think one of the reasons you see some of these uh, synthetic asset protocols, like us and synthetics are, are great examples of this, moving to layer two earlier 
um, is that at least for DYDX, especially, I don't, I don't want to talk for synthetic, so I'll let you answer for that. But at least for us, I'd say composability is a little bit less important because we don't need there to be like a ton of tokens to trade on the, the actual blockchain that we're using. It's synthetic, right? So the entire point is that we can kind of create assets out of like one collateral asset or, or multi-collateral assets or whatever you have. But for DYDX, we just have one collateral asset and then we can kind of create like every different type of thing that pe people might want to trade based off of that. Um, so for that reason, and also in derivative systems or synthetic systems, the first thing that you always have to do before trading anyways is deposit because you have to put down collateral like, and then you can trade based off of that collateral that you have down. And this is just a really similar experience to kind of depositing collateral onto a layer two system. So at least for DYDX, we're really optimistic that the product that we're going to be able to build on layer two is going to be really significantly improved in a lot of ways. And we're not going to be so limited by kind of the composability. So that's why you see us moving to layer two a little bit earlier. Yeah, agreed. It's the same thing, same thing for us, right? Like, you know, we have the luxury of kind of bringing our whole ecosystem across to that L2, which means, you know, we can be a first mover without, uh, you know, incurring a, a huge cost to it, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that leads to the next interesting question is how do you feel that composability fits into accelerating DeFi and the value it provides to users you know, what are the pieces of composability that you do find important, whether that's, you know, the token from layer one being on a layer two or whether that's data from oracles or, you know, how does, how does composability play into your plans or your views on how DeFi and its value is, is, is delivered uh, going forward? Um, Kane, if, if you could share your, your views on that. Sure. So, so, I mean, I've got one very specific example uh, that we've been working on for a while. Um, Anton uh, from One Inch has actually been uh, kind of collaborating with us and, and Michael from uh, Curve and a few other people to kind of help uh, get this over the line, uh, which is essentially to, to use these synthetic assets as bridges across different AMM pools, right? So, um, you know, we've got this situation at the moment where if you want to trade uh, one type of stable coin into another, you can get, you know, a, a 10, $15 million trade uh, filled, you know, with very little slippage, right? Um, same thing for if you're trading different types of uh, synthetic Bitcoin, right? You can, you can trade, uh, you know, $5 million with a RAM BTC into RAP BTC pretty easily. But what you can't do uh, because of the design of some of these AMM pools is cross those pools, right? Uh, so, you know, we, uh, we've been working with a number of different teams. And I think this is really, you know, in the past, it's kind of been everyone working in isolation and then after the fact, kind of hooking things together. But I think the ecosystem now has developed to a point where we all kind of know each other, we can have these conversations, we can kind of work collaboratively. So we're working on uh, building these virtual bridges, right, uh, between these AMM pools. Um, and like even yesterday, we were doing some uh, some kind of uh, fork testing on a fork mainnet. Um, and I think it was a, a $10 million USDC trade into RAP BTC, uh, which through, you know, one inch right now, uh, the fill would have been like 805 BTC and using a bridge plus you know, one inches mechanism, it was going to be like a 831 BTC, which is a pretty huge difference in, in the fill across that $10 million trade, right? So, um, you know, I, I think we are starting to see like a, a next, you know, second order effect in terms of, uh, you know, collaboration and, and coordination across these different protocols to make sure that, um, you know, we're utilizing all the functionality, right? Which is not easy to do if you're working in isolation. So the, these sorts of things I think are, are really exciting. And I know a bunch of people are working on different, uh, you know, sort of collaborative uh, things. Andre is always collaborating with people um, from, from Wire. And so it, it's a really exciting time at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see a number of people just clicking together different pieces and different parts and making more and more advanced use of, of all the different kind of smart contracts that teams like yours make and, and then composing them into more, more advanced contracts, more advanced offerings and driving more value, total value locked into them, building interfaces around those contracts, which they might not have even made themselves. All of that is really kind of, I think, the future of financial engineering, really, which is, which is what we're looking at. So, I mean, from, from your point of view, Sergey, how, how do you see this? How do you see uh, composability playing a role in accelerating DeFi's value? How do you see various 
pieces of composability, whether that's, uh, you know, pieces from other DeFi protocols, whether that's data from oracles, whether that's any other composable piece, how do you see any of that? How do, how do you see that fitting into DeFi's growth and its ability to deliver value to users? Yeah, from my point of view, DeFi is all about uh, composability, about money lingos. So we uh, have built a startup of uh, just because we just use all the money Legos. So uh, on the hackathon last year, we had just used the money Lego from Uniswap, Kyber, and uh, Banker. And uh, over that, we built just an own, own platform, which uh, um, aggregates and offer better user experience and solve problems and save money. And uh, without this money Legos, it would, would be possible, wouldn't be possible to, to build such uh, tools like we, we built. Yeah? We have worked uh, in the last uh, like year uh, almost with everyone except DYDX. We didn't find any touch points, uh, unfortunately. Um, but we are looking uh, uh, in direction, uh, leverage positions and so on, um, which we maybe can use. And um, it, it makes fun yeah, to work with a lot of different companies, uh, startups, and uh, use those products. Uh, I compare it with the traditional technical world, like these are small microservices and everyone can use it in permissionless manner. And this is great. Like for example, uh, your oracles, yeah, we, used, we use your oracles um, um, to, to avoid uh, Zinfone failures by getting the, the prices. Yeah, we, we can just do the on-chain calls uh, on on Ethereum nodes or maybe in Fura nodes, whatever. Uh, else, um, but you will get the red data yeah, because it's it's uh, permissionless, yeah? and uh, the whole DeFi is about that. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think that's really what underpins the 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 power of this space is just like you had people in the web world making libraries and making various tools that people then connected together into killer apps like Uber or something else, right? Like Uber. The people who made Uber, they didn't build a GPS system. They didn't build Stripe for payments. They didn't build Twilio for messaging, right? People like only see Uber, but really Uber is a combination of these other building blocks. And, and I think I'm really excited that the reliability of blockchains finally creates these financial engineering building blocks that can, can be composed by teams like yours and others. And it's, it's, it's really very exciting because I think it, it's a very clear picture of the future in that if you can have these highly reliable building blocks and really competent teams that compose those building blocks, then the sky's the limit, just like the web world surprised everybody with e-commerce and Uber and 50 other things nobody could have predicted back in the 90s, right? And that's kind of, I think, the, the, where, where we are as a, as a starting point. But I'd, I'd also be thrilled to hear Antonio's point of view, you know, how do you feel that composability will accelerate DeFi? How will it provide value to users? You know, how do you how do you think that various composable pieces, whether they're pieces from other pro protocols, oracles, other composable pieces, how do these composable different building blocks fit together in, in your vision for how DeFi develops? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, it's been amazing to watch just a lot of the composability things. I mean, I think DEX aggregators like One Inch and others have been a really amazing first example of this. Um, how you can basically just try to get the best price across a bunch of different DEXs. Um, I guess my view on this and, and something we've been working on at, at DYDX and the way we normally build is a little bit different than I would say the, the way most people in DeFi build, for better or worse. Um, we try to build things more vertically integrated a little bit, so we kind of rely a little bit less on some of the composability aspects. Not that I'm saying that's kind of the optimal way to build, that's just the way we structured our product and our company. Um, just really being product first and, and focused on what can we do to always build the best product. I will say that there are still, a, even with that mentality, there are still a couple like really important ways that composability is important to us. So you touched on this a little bit, but certainly price oracles, you know, we don't want to build our own price oracles. That's a really hard problem. Great people like Chainlink, Maker like others are working on this. Um, and we integrate um, with you guys on that. So I think that's a really important way that we benefit from composability. Um, another interesting thing that we've done with composability is we basically use um, one of the automated market makers curve um, to kind of sit as a proxy contract in front of our contracts, which just because basically 
DYDX only supports one type of collateral, but we want other people who have other types of collateral to be able to use the system too. So they can basically come to DYDX, they can quickly exchange their say USDT to like USDC collateral, which they can then use on DYDX. And this all happens behind the scenes, but this was actually extremely easy for us to implement. Probably took us like two or three engineer days to implement this. And this is just a real testament to what's possible with composability on Ethereum with these building blocks that anybody can use. Like we didn't have to go and talk to Curve or like their team or anybody to be able to do this. We just started using it um, and our product, you know, really benefited from that. Yeah, all, all of those types of dynamics, once again, are super, super impressive to me that people can just connect all these systems and make a better financial product than what you would see from a bank. More transparency, amazingly better yield. So more transparency, better, better economics and permissionless innovation and global access, right? Like those three things are, are, are quite, quite powerful forces. Yeah. So at, at, at the end of the day, it's, it seems like there's, there's plans that people have for scaling DeFi. There's demand for DeFi to scale. There's composability that allows teams to quickly compose and, and build these more advanced applications and kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and also give back to a community of, of, of building blocks that then other people also use and also give back to. So these, these are two very, very powerful dynamics. I mean, how how do you think on on the backs of these on the back of these two types of powerful dynamics? Let's say they work out. Let's say you have scalability. Let's say composability gets everybody all the building blocks they need. You know, how how do you see DeFi achieving mainstream adoption and really going kind of maybe beyond, not even beyond the crypto world, but going to the crypto world and then to the mainstream world? But how how do you see DeFi adoption really growing to to new heights and beyond? And I I, I think if you know if Sergey, if you have a point of view on this, I'd be thrilled to hear how you see this this kind of evolving. Yeah, <clears throat> if you can solve the problem with the scalability, then we have to solve the problem with the usability, and uh, uh, we, we need we need more user friendly applications, uh, mobile applications, so uh, and and uh, from our point of view as, as well, desktop applications to uh, offer uh, everyone to enter peace this uh, new role yeah, uh, um, for finances and uh, yeah, offer access from, from any point uh, on the globe yeah, uh, to, to access uh, decentralized finances. Um, when I started to use uh, Ethereum and some DeFi applications, I thought, uh, well, this is a piece of shit. <laughs> and, uh, and, how it can it work? Yeah, and then uh, I, I started to understand it. Uh, yeah, it has to be done in this way because of these limitations of Ethereum and, and scalability. And uh, but anyway, yeah, we we tried also from our side to improve the user, user, usability and uh, continue to do that and hope we can uh, grow in this uh, space yeah, in the next future and. Um, I hope in, uh, maybe in one or two years we'll see uh, more people in DeFi space uh, because it's uh, it's it's about freedom. Uh, DeFi is freedom from our point of view. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I mean, I think it's very difficult to marry security and usability. I think that's kind of the challenge that a lot of these blockchains and private key-based systems have, right? So. I think people just knock up against that problem and they're like, wow, private keys are really tough to deal with in a usable way. Um, Antonio, I mean, how, how do you feel about this? How do you think DeFi will, will achieve mainstream adoption in your opinion? Yeah, I echo everything Sergey says. I think it really has to start with just from a product first perspective, building products that at least are every bit as good as like centralized exchanges and other centralized products people use to interact with crypto. And then start, like once we're on par, I think from a product perspective, that's really hard to do just as a first step. Like there are a lot of problems with scalability, usability that we've touched on that need to be solved there. But once we've solved those problems, I think a lot of the kind of second order improvements that DeFi gives you in terms of just the ability to use censorship resistant financial platforms, to use financial platforms that are really owned by the community in a lot of cases, um, that can that have you know really great interoperability with other products. I think like once we solve the product challenges, those second order benefits will really start to shine through, and that'll be kind of the the big turning point for DeFi um, in terms of 
you know, once we get mass adoption, but I think there's just going to be a lot of building that goes on, especially in the next year or so. We're seeing a lot of it happen right now with some of the leading projects moving to layer two. Um, a lot of the layer two is coming out, uh, improving over time. And I think once some of the projects put up a kind of MVP on layer two, then we'll probably need about like six to 12 months to work out all the product kinks after that. But I, you know, my estimate would probably be in the next like, you know, 12 to 18 months, if not sooner, we'll really see some products that are every bit as good as, you know, centralized products. And that's when we'll start to see mass adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I think we definitely need to reach a certain, um, I mean, at least feature parity, right? <laughs> you don't, you don't want it. That's not like the goal. Let's get this be just as good. Right. You, you, so you have to go beyond that, but I think, yeah, I think that's the, the first, the first kind of stop there. Kane, how, how do you feel about this? What, what do you think will help DeFi achieve mainstream adoption in, in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, you know, users, uh, normal people don't care about, uh, the tech, they don't care about the process, they care about, you know, the result, right, the experience that they they have. And if you tell them that they're going to get, uh, you know, uh, some better thing, right, but it's going to be 10 times harder to use, no one gives a fuck, right, no one's going to do that. Um, you know, maybe some like early adopters and, and people that, uh, you know, really care about the intricacies of the thing will will do it um, but users want it to be easy right they want all the complexity abstract away abstracted away they really want um, you know that that end-to-end -end experience to be powerful and and the question I guess that we need to ask is like what is that experience you know what is the thing that's going to drive product market fit um, and you know I think something that you you mentioned earlier uh, in the panel that for me is probably, you know, in my mind right now. And I, I don't think we know what it's going to be, but I think one potential thing is yield, right? Like we're in a zero interest rate environment, right? Um, and, you know, we've got this, you know, if you can get one or 2% yield for someone, right? In a sane fashion, that's easy to use, that isn't crazy, their money isn't gonna all blow up or whatever, right? Uh, I think that that's a, a very, very powerful thing. What we haven't been able to do is kind of, you know, put that end-to-end -end experience together for a user that is, you know, as good as, you know, a TradFi uh, or, or centralized finance uh, product, right? So if we can take the, the DeFi, you know, uh, yields that we've got and package them up in a way that's, that's really, um, you know, removes all the complexity, all the confusion uh, and onboard users in a, in a you know, uh, a sane way, I think that that's something that could significantly drive adoption. Um, but, you know, as Antonio mentioned, there's a lot of things that are missing, right? Like we don't have Twilio, like there's no, you know, like there's a whole bunch of components that you want to stitch together. They just aren't there yet. Right. Um, you know, the system can't scale, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to solve all those problems and then we need to really focus on what the end user experience is that we're going to deliver. And I think if we do those things, then, you know, people are, are ready for it. They're, they'll, they'll, they'll come in waves. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I hope we can maybe provide more of those components in oracles and various other data inputs and payment outputs and whatever, whatever other systems people need. But I completely agree with you about about the yield dynamic. I think the like maybe I don't think half, but a very substantial double digit percentage of the global financial system is like getting access to the federal funds rate, getting access to bond yield, getting access to a savings bank account somewhere, right? And if you just give people People don't know or care like where that interest rate comes from. I, I personally think this will even get to a point where bank interfaces and Robinhood and like all these other places will as an interface eventually drive users into these DeFi protocols because that's the place where they can give the most competitive yield to their users. And that's what they're gonna wanna do, right? That's what they want for their users is whatever their users want and their users want yield and if the global financial system doesn't give them yield, they'll go wherever the yield is. That's just, that's just how the financial system works. And so I think that's, that's kind of the amazing thing is that the amount of collateral and the diversity of collateral slowly improving and the transparency of where the yield comes from and the, therefore the counterparty risk management, it's, it's all super impressive. And I'm, and I'm really grateful that there are smart teams like yours and, and the other people on this panel really putting together these building blocks and composing them together and making making our industry actually not just about like making tokens and selling tokens, but about financial products that do things like generate yield 
And I think that's going to really open up people's eyes to what blockchains and smart contracts can really do separately from generating tokens, which, which is a good starting point because it seeds value. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think it's very exciting times ahead. And I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that, you know, there are great smart people like you, Sergey, Antonio, and Kane working on this. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, other people like me and others can build, help build infrastructure that supports you and that all of us together can build, build a truly decentralized, transparent future that, that gives everybody all over the world access to, to yield and all these kind of financial products. It's, it's very exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm truly, you know, thrilled and grateful to be working on it. So it, with, with, with you as well. So, so thank you very much for discussing it here with me and, and looking forward to seeing you, you know, in the digital, in the digital bubble zoom room world until we can finally get together in person, which I'm, which I'm really looking forward to as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great conversation guys.